Amen. In the north. Amen. And uh, we were uh, we were at Cracker Barrel yesterday. I've had this happen two or three times since I've been here. You got an accent. Where are you from? California. No, no, you're not from California. Yeah, I'm, I live in California. Well, you're not from California. No, I was born and raised in Missouri. Misery. Amen. <laughs> and uh, uh, <clears throat> so... Anyway, I'll, I'll leave accents alone and all that because that would probably get me in trouble. Amen. But uh, let's turn to the word of the Lord. Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to use this for a launch, launching pad. And uh, Brother Shatwell needs to hurry up and get back so when I talk about him, he can be in here when I do it. <laughs> Amen. I love picking on Brother Shatwell. I stand out there. Some people don't know how to take it. So before service, I stand out there today and a couple people out there, and I said, but Brother Chad was just getting started. I said, you know, it's, if he wasn't so ugly, I could listen to him a lot better. <laughs> and they're like, what? I said, yeah, and I'm afraid I'm going to get lost up there in those eyebrows. And I said, so, you know. <laughs> now, listen, trust me, he can dish it out just as much. And so... Anyway, but um, uh, we did pastor for 10 years. We pastored about 35 miles from one another. And when we first went there, I went to Okmulgee in May of 1988. I think the Chatwells went in September of 1988 to Okima 35. And trust me, we, we had projects. And so, you know, we'd go play golf and, and on Mondays. And I'd talk him out of resigning one Monday. And he'd talk me out of resigning the next Monday. And, and then... Then he'd have me come over and preach, and it was chainsaw massacres. Oh, I'm, tell <laughs> I'm telling you, it, it was something, and uh, we had quite a few experiences there. Amen. And, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's a good memory. Well, most of them are good memories. And uh, so, anyway. All right, let's, let's read verse of Scripture here. Matthew chapter 16 and... Verse number 18, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, tomorrow night, I'm not sure yet which way I'm going. I'm leaning very close on the second part of that, the gates of hell shall not prevail. So I may get into that tomorrow night and a little more inspiration on and all that. But today I want to focus on the statement, I will build my church. I will build my church. Amen. And um, thank God for that verse. It gives you a lot of consolation. When you're in the thick of the battle, you have to remember. He said he'd build his church. I've been around a few people telling them how bad the church was and the church is compromising and the church is going down and the church is this and the church is that. And, and uh, matter of fact, I was at a conference one time and it was, it, it was getting pretty negative. And so I just, at the table, I said, you know, sounds to me like you guys don't have much faith. What's that? I said, he said he'd have a church. Now, you and I may not be a part of it, but he's going to have a church. And it's going to be a victorious church. It's going to be a growing church. Mm. So that's just the way it is. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to minister today. I ask that you'd help me to minister effectively. I take authority over anything that would try to hinder I feel faith in this place right now. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Uh, you can be seated. Let me take a little side note here just for a second. Amen. And I want to, I give honor to Brother Sister here today. Amen. Appreciate him and what he's doing and Brother Hobson. Amen. Uh, Brother Shatwell very capably uh, uh, painted a picture today on, on how to keep yourself safe. 
And so um, I thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord that he's transparent and, and uh, uh, honest with us. And, and I think it's necessary. But there's a second part to that today. And I'm not, this is not my subject, but I just want to allude to it. Uh, we hear a lot about adultery, and rightfully so. Uh, we talk about the sin of David, and we only view it as the sin of adultery. But the real sin of David was not just adultery, but what he is reminded for, what it's re in reference to many times in the scripture is, he, he had a brother killed. And we, we often only point out, I showed Brother Hobson a while ago from James, it talks about two things, adultery, and then it talks about killing. And if we violate or, or offend in the scripture, in one point we're guilty of all. And if we're not careful... We focus so much, and again, this is not refuting anything we just heard, but we hear so much about, especially in the United Pentecost Church, the sin of adultery. But James says, here's how you blaspheme his name. And he goes into the royal law of the kingdom, meaning that you love your brother. And he says, now, we know the same scripture says, thou shalt not commit adultery, says thou shalt not kill. And we can get so focused on the adultery part of it, but we completely condone and overlook another major thing, and that's killing each other. I said this one time at Because of Times, and I know it was kind of like, I said basically the only two things in the UPC you lose your license over is adultery and not paying your dues. But if we'd start holding people to the same measure when they murder one another, and the scripture teaches us how we murder, we hate. Oh, I'm already off on the wrong foot here. And we, we, we really need to, because I'm going to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, the two areas basically that you'll really be tested in is the subject that he just talked about, and the other one is is in letting brotherly love continue and in your relationships, not just with your spouse, but also in relationship with brothers and sisters. And that's usually, that's where the attack is. And I will tell you right now that in our society right now, it's a major deal about hating one another and destroying one another and all that. And I'm afraid if we're not careful, that's creeping into the church. Are you with me here? That's creeping into the church. You know, you don't have to have any proof or anything. You just repeat something, say something, and you've completely destroyed the character, the reputation. You've just assassinated somebody. And boy, we don't like it out there, but we'll condone it in here. It's, it's a little quiet. It usually does when we get here. Because this is really where we live. I don't know about you, but I'm telling you in the last few months, I've had this edge and anger, just wanting to get mad at it, just like in stuff and all. And I am reminded over and over again that, you know what, you need to be careful because that's what's out there and that's what's taken over out there. But it doesn't need to come in here. It doesn't need to come in here. By this shall that doesn't just mean, but it means every generation from, from that point all the way to 2018, this is how they'll know. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. He didn't say it because you got long hair, long sleeves. Because I've met a lot of people got all that, but they meaner than junkyard dogs. But what he did say, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. And the fact is that's where we're at right now. And our, the stage is set in America, especially in the world. The stage is set. God has positioned the world 
for the church to come on the scene, not with just casting out devils and healing blinded eyes and all that, but God has set the stage for the church to come on the scene and for the world to see what the true love of God ought to look like. Does that make sense? Love never fails. Paul said prophecies and all that may not get the job done. Love never fails. I feel very strong that uh, this is stuff that as many opportunities I have to just kind of bump this a little bit because I see this as an overall situation and uh, the enemy will work on you and work on, you work on your, in your families. Brother Shatwell's alluded to it several times about husbands and wives. He said if you're you know, not getting along, you can't fight all the way to church and get up there and fake something. And peace has to be in our homes, and there has to be. And peace means that you're in agreement with the God, in agreement with each other. Praise God. So that's why the enemy hits it so hard and trying to get an offense or mad at each other and all that stuff and all. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, in spite of what everybody else tells you, we need each other. We really do. We need each other. And this, I don't need anybody. I'm autonomous. I don't find that in the scripture. That's not in the scripture. It's not in the scripture. And so, all right, I've, I've messed that up bad enough. So let's, let's go into the subject here. Uh, okay, let me just kind of uh, mess up your th traditions. Uh, I, uh, I went into uh, this office that I hold. Uh, with this, uh, matter of fact, the night before I was penalized and voted in, <laughs> I, I preached on Arise and Build. So when I talk to you today about building, it's not just, uh, it, it's something that God's put into my spirit. Uh, I was dealing with a situation, especially uh, uh, just a lot of rubble in certain things. And I read over there where Nehemiah was viewing the rubble, seeing the rubble. And it was so devastating because he's, you know, they all seen it. What used to be Jerusalem, matter of fact, the Bible says, before thee this mountain shall be made a plain. The mountain that Zerubbabel seen was the, the city of Jerusalem. It looked like a, nothing but a mountain of rubble. And so what God was saying is, I'm going to take that rubble, and that's what I'm going to use to rebuild so before you, it's going to become a plain. So don't curse that rubble. And so sometimes we view rubble in our life as something negative, but God views it as something positive. That's the very thing I'm going to use to, to rebuild this. And so, But what I noticed was is the attitude, and if we're not careful, uh, we can get into particular, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, cultures. And, and I say this very cautiously because I believe in one part of the church it is necessary uh, that this happen. Is, but if we're not careful, we can get into what I call a maintenance culture or a maintaining culture. To where that's basically, that's who we are, what we are, is we just want to maintain. We get into this maintenance, and I do believe it's very important. Now, let me give you a little verse of scripture. If you know company's coming, prophet Isaiah said, if you know children are coming, then here's what you've got to do. You've got to, first of all, enlarge the borders of thy habitation. And so then he said, then you need to lengthen the cord, strengthen the stake, spare not. So to me, these are areas of ministry that are very vital and very needed. I view the, the lengthening or the expanding of the borders, I view that as spiritual warfare or prayer. If you're going to increase and you're going to build out further, you've got to have geographical territory, so you've got to take it. So to enlarge our borders means that we need prayer initiatives and we need prayer, and Brother Shatwell has been talking about that. We need to get involved in expanding our spiritual boundaries. The next thing he said is, is lengthen the cord, which I believe is evangelism, and expanding out. But then he said, but strengthen the stake. To me, that's training. That is our maintenance. That's making sure that we don't get this thing so stretched out that we don't have something to sustain it and to keep it. Am I making sense? And then spare not means don't build too small. 
get a good vision of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. But if we're not careful, we get so focused strictly on one or two of those components. Now, I have learned that in the work of God that there are ministries and churches that are very gifted and have dynamics in one of those areas. I know some churches that are not too gifted on evangelism. But, buddy, they can lock into spiritual warfare and knock the head off the devil quicker than anybody you've ever seen. I'm going to say a couple things probably going to get me in trouble. I know other churches that are very good on evangelism. I know other ministries and churches that are very good on training and discipling and all that stuff. It doesn't have to be, you got to choose one. We need all of those in operation for this thing to expand and for this thing to build out. So we have to learn in the organization, in our districts, and around us. Matter of fact, the scripture says that a threefold cord is hard to break. I believe for you to truly impact an area, you need a key church that's very good at evangelism. You need a key church or ministry that's very good in training and discipling. And you need another key church that's prayer. And if you can get those three working together, a three-fold cord's hard to break, and you can tear something up for the good in an area if you can. Does that make sense to anybody? Or let those three ministries function and operate. Now, so when I went into this, this is what I began to see. And I thought, you know what? We need to change the paradigm. Because if you look at Nehemiah and you look at all of them, then what you see is it was a culture of fear, culture of doubt, ultimate lack of resources, and on and on it went. Nehemiah said, we got to change that culture. Uh-oh. And that's exactly what it is. We need to change it to one of faith. We need to change it to one of accepting the challenge. So Nehemiah said, let us arise and build, for God will strengthen our hand. And I have learned until you arise to build, God's not going to strengthen your hand. Matter of fact, Hebrews said they wax valiant in fight. You don't get valiant and then go get in the fight. You get in the fight, and God says, that's all I needed now. I'm going to give you everything you need to be victorious. I'm going to, does that make sense to anybody here? So you can't sit on the sidelines, look at all the rubble, look at everything, and talk about it and get together. Tell it, oh, well, this is the problem. This is the problem with our church. This is the problem with the organization. This is the problem with the district. This is the problem with everybody except me. This is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. Well, get in the battle and help fix it then. Always easy to sit on the sidelines. Well, if the quarterback would have done this, and if the running back would have turned that away, if the defense would have, you ain't never played a day in your life. How do you know all that? Until you're out there on the field getting your head knocked off. I thought you'd understand that analogy very well. Now, let's 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 just real quickly here. So I, I kind of you know, okay, we got to change this whole culture to, to out of a out of a kind of a maintaining, and that's a part of it. There's times that we need that to operate very strongly, but the deal is, is we we need. To, so I, I started talking to the district and talking about some of this stuff and all. And uh, well, when I got into this, when I really got into it, uh, I, I I started writing out a little deal. Now, I'm very good at starting to write something and get a lot of it done, and then it's just sitting on a shelf somewhere. I could be a multi, multi millionaire if I just finished a few. <laughs> anyway, so, so I, 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 I got to thinking about this because the Apostle Paul, and we'll go well, just a second, but the Apostle Paul uses this term. He says, For I am a wise master builder. So I got to look at that statement, and what I realized was is that it doesn't mean that he just knew how to build, but he knew how to draw the blueprints. He knew the resources. So it wasn't just that he knew how to pick up a hammer himself and hit the nail. There's a lot of other components because that's what he gets into. Matter of fact, uh, I, 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 well, I'll do this. Uh, I have the notes here on that whole Corinthians, and I could probably send them somebody. You can print them out and you can take them home. But the deal is, is, what he gets, he says, I'm a wise master builder. So I, I got to look at that, and then I got to thinking, well, let's look in the scripture and let's learn some lessons from the builders. I mean, that'd be, you know, 
if you're going to get, if you're going to be a builder or get into a trade, they normally have you, what, what's the word? Apprentice. And then a what, a journeyman? Is that not correct? So you just don't wake up one day and say, you know what? I'm going to go build a house. <laughs> have fun. But if you're going to master this as a trade, then there's got to be somebody over here that knows how to do it. They've done it. They've got the experience, and you work with them. Now, that's something that especially all of us males in the building, we don't like to admit that. But Jesus himself was an apprentice at one time. Ooh. So I got to look. Is it getting quiet? Kind of. I got to look at all this, and, and I, I said, you know what? Um, okay. Uh, well, what do we learn from these? So I, I, I went back. First thing is we learn from the very foundation of the world. It, you need to learn lessons from wisdom. Wisdom laid the foundation of the world. Wisdom has built her house. So I think that we need to uh, let wisdom teach us some things. And if it's the true wisdom of God, it's peaceable. I had a guy tell me one time God spoke to him and gave him wisdom what to do this and everywhere he went he left a wave of destruction and I told him I said I hate to tell you this that's not the wisdom of God mm. so wisdom we learn lessons from wisdom and then okay what's the next lesson we, well, we learn from Noah Noah was a builder what do we learn from Noah we learn you got to build it exactly according to the blueprint and you need grace Noah found grace. And so that's what we learned from Noah. Then what's the next one? Well, the next major building project I see in the scripture is the Tower of Babel. And so the Tower of Babel teaches us we learn lessons from them. Number one, they had a location. Number two, they started putting back resources. They had a vision, and the people were one. So these are lessons. The greatest thing that the enemy can use, learning from God, in this case, is how to divide the people. Whoa. How to divide the people. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> Whoo! Thank Jesus. Amen. <laughs> that would have been on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else. I think I'll stand kind of back over here a little bit. And so, what was I talking about? Amen. <laughs> God said the people, are, they have one language, they speak one thing. And so he says, we're going to have to get that. So as the enemy knows if I can just get you to quit speaking the same thing and everybody have their own vision. Now, I don't know if this is correct, but this is what I tell. I have some young men that come to San Francisco for a while. We want to come kind of see, you know, and all. And I said, okay, that's fine. But now here's the deal. When you're here, you have no vision and you have no ministry. They're like, what? That's right. You don't have a vision and you don't have a ministry. We have one vision in this church and we have one ministry in this church. And I'm not just talking about Martin Morgan's ministry. But if you get all this diversity and, you know, here's the thing. If you got two, divi two visions, that's called division. And that's one of the greatest things that the enemy causes us to do is, is to get over here in some silo type deal to where, well, I, I got mine and I got you know, and all this stuff and all. And he knows, well, you know. Brother, Dr. Hughes told us the other day, he said, if you use the terminology from the scripture, one can put a thousand, two, ten thousand, three, a hundred thousand. He said, it only takes eight people to impact the entire world population. That's it. Do the math. And so the enemy knows that, so he does everything in his power to create division and to get us speaking different languages. Have you ever read over there uh, how good and pleasant it is for brother to dwell together in unity? You can be in unity but not be together. What? Yeah. Together in unity. See, we all can be in unity means we're in agreement with God's plan. That's what unity means. We're in agreement with God's plan, but that may not mean we're together. We're all in unity. God wants to do this, but are we together in doing that? And that's, that's where the enemy tries to work very strong. So those are lessons that we learned from that. Then I went from there, and this is where I really got hung up, and I won't get hung up here today. I learned lessons from another builder, Abraham. 
What does Abraham teach us? Abraham teaches us how to build altars. Four altars that Abraham built, five visitations, and when Joshua and them came into the land, the first four places that they visited was the location of Abraham's altars. Because an altar is not just a place. Now, I will tell you this. I hear people say, as long as you pray, you know, that's the altar. That's not true. You can pray but not have an altar. An altar is a place of death. And you can pray and pray amiss, and you can pray out of your own will and your own lust. That's what James got into. He said, that's how you ask amiss. You're praying out of your own lust, your own desires. You're praying out of your own understanding instead of the understanding of God. And so it's easy for us, well, I pray, so that means that I have an altar. No, you can pray but not have an altar. Does that make sense? The altar is a place of death, and the only way that you can do the will of God is you've got to die daily, 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 daily. Does that make sense to anybody here? And I'm going to come to that here and back to that in just a second. So we learn that from Abraham. Uh, some of the others, uh, where am I going? Uh, Solomon. Solomon teaches us how to build a great house. Now, Brother Sistrunk, this is where we kind of, I get a little repercussion. Is So how, what, what does he teach us? Number one, Solomon teaches us that it's okay to get resources out of Israel. Uh -oh. Yeah, it is. So Solomon goes and hires a guy by the name of Hiram. He is a master craftsman, the best in the world. He said, I need you to come work with our guys. Oh, yeah, that's what I thought. And he got cedars from Lebanon, and he reached out and got all this stuff coming from outside because he's going to build a great house. Now, we have a hang-up in thinking that there might be somebody better at this than I am that I can learn from. Mic check one. Does that make sense? Uh, I learned how to eat crawfish from the master. Brother Ewing could teach you how to eat crawfish. Now, if you're going to learn how to eat something, find a fat man. Don't, don't go find a skinny guy. <laughs> I first, I, I, I first time I went to preach to Brother Ewing, I said, he said, Bubba, I, I said, I've never had crawfish. I want you to take me. So we go down there, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, Bubba, if you don't learn how to do this, he said, you can eat yourself hungry. <laughs> and so he showed a little trick on how to do all this and peel them and all. And so trust me, I went down there enough, worked with the journeyman, until I become pretty good at it myself, Brother Spell. And then I was preaching for Brother Kraft. And after church one night, he had a crawfish boil. And there's some old boys from around. I don't, need, I don't know if they went to church, but they was all over at his house. And after church, we were sitting there. And I still pastor in an old monkey. And so we're sitting there. And, and I mean, boy, I'm, you know, I'm eating five to their one. And I looked up. I said, hey, guys, man, what's this? You know, I told them. You know, I said, this is, I mean, and so, okay. And so a little <laughs> A little later, I look down, they still, you know, no, 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 no. Watch, I, you know, and one of them said, I don't need anybody from Oklahoma telling me how to eat crawfish. <laughs> now, I didn't say it, brother, sister, but this is what I thought. Well, okay, you dumb redneck, go ahead and eat them your way. <laughs> eat yourself hungry. <laughs> Have you ever tried to bring, I, I'm talking to home missionaries, so this, but trust me, have you ever hired a professional sound man to come in to perfect your sound system and to teach your sound man how to operate that? Oh, people get all, boy, it's quiet, 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 territorial. What in the world? But I bind that devil. Bro, say that. Well, I bind that devil right now. <laughs> I thought the microphone, this battery went out. 
thought, as long as Brother Shatwell went, he'd probably run the battery down. <laughs> All right, I, I didn't mean it. Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, well, I don't even know what I was going to say. Yeah, but there's something else I was going <laughs> Okay, I must not, I'm not supposed to say it, so here we go. So he, he, he has Hiram come in. So we learn from that. We learn resource. We learn all that stuff. Then I got over into them rebuilding. And basically the lessons we learned from Nehemiah and Ezra and all those strategically is how to build systems. They had to rebuild a social system. They had to rebuild the law. I mean, all the systems, they were gone, so they had to come in. And if you'll watch, each one of those men was very gifted in a particular area. And so we learn from that. Well, then I've already quoted to you about Paul saying, I'm a wise. So I went from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So I get over here to Paul, I am a wise master builder. And he starts talking about the foundation because what was happening in the Corinthian church is, is there were guys that had come in saying, we're super apostles. That's the term that's used in there, super apostles. <laughs> they weren't just apostles, they were super apostles. And so the Corinthian church is, Paul, what are we going to do? Paul said, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. Every man's work should be tried by fire. We get so worried about, did you know what that guy's doing? You know what that church is doing? You know, quit worrying about it. God's got his own way of dealing with it. If it's wood, hay, and stubble, trust me. When God gets through with it, it'd be nothing but ashes. I'm going to get to that here in a second. Now, this, okay. Now, so I've skipped over the main one. So, in, in the little booklet that I was writing, I, 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 this is what I said. Lessons from the carpenter. Jesus. Is not this the carpenter? Carpenter's son? So, I, well, I like that lesson. So, I just, you know, I want to look up the word carpenter. And when I looked up the word carpenter, it simply means a builder. But, how many, you know, all of my life, I see Jesus over there with a, what's, with a plane and on wood, you know, what's, whatever it is, down at his feet and, and him sawing and hammering. Listen, I was really amazed to find out that Jesus was more than likely a stonemason. I know, there went your whole Christmas program. <laughs> They had very few trees in that area. They made very little out of trees. Basically, everything was made out of stone. Does that make sense? And so I, I, I whoa, stone. Yeah, stone. Well, now some of the sayings start making a little more sense. Matter of fact, one historian says that, that Jesus' stepfather Joseph was probably a stonemason that would cut stones and stuff to work Herod and all that stuff that he was building. And so that's why I said even Jesus himself subjected himself to his father to learn a trade. There's nothing wrong with us wanting to learn from a journeyman or wanting to learn from somebody that's already built something. You know, if you're going to get advice on finances, make sure the guy's got some money. I told you if you want to learn how to eat, find a fat man, but you don't want to go to a fat man on advice for a diet. <laughs> Does that make sense? So the deal is, here, <laughs> I need to leave that alone. We got to be politically correct. I probably shouldn't be saying anything about any of this. So anyway, so the deal is, I was just like, oh. So now, what's, what's some of the terminology? He said, Peter. Petra, rock, little rock, not Arkansas, little rock. Upon this rock, I will, I'll do what? I'll build my church. Now, do you remember where Jesus is, the, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, all that mix in there, and he comes over there, and they said, do you hear what these are saying? And he said, hey, if these don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. 
I had, we had a guy you know, in our home church growing up, ever saw from our pastor, say, okay, we're going to have one service, and it's all uh, sermonettes for these young men to learn how to preach and stuff and all. So he'd give us all about five, ten minutes. And a friend of mine, I love him dearly, uh, Rick Phillips, there in Oklahoma. He, he, he went and got some rocks and painted smiley faces on them and, and, and stacked them all up from the pulpit. Well, that, this is in the days of cassette tape players. So you got a bunch of people praising and worshiping God. So the whole point of his message is, if you people don't want to praise God, these rocks will cry out. Well, he gets right to that moment. And he gives the sign to the sound guy back there. I love sound people. You guys are wonderful people. <laughs> He, he gives a sign to the guy to hit the button to play the tape, you know, and all of a sudden it's like these stones are crying out. Well, if you know anything about cassette tape players, they were also very famous for eating the tape. And so instead of it being praise and worship to God, I mean, this is his whole message. He's built up to this moment right here. And instead of it being, I love you, he's like, <laughs> and he's kind of looking at the stones. Oh my God, the stones aren't even going to praise him here tonight. I'm really in trouble. <laughs> I don't think, matter of fact, I know that Jesus was not in reference to these rocks laying on the ground, but what he was in reference to, because he's a builder. If you Jews, being the stones as you should, if you don't want to do this, because in that statement, he's already said about that temple over there. You see that temple over there? Yeah, I'm not going to leave one stone upon another. Ooh, ooh. I'm not going to leave one upon another. So if you don't want to be my habitation and you don't want to be what I'm building, then I'll raise up some other stones and I'll raise up these rocks, meaning Gentiles, us. Ooh. That's why when Peter starts writing, and notice it doesn't say the epistle of Simon, it says the epistle of Peter, meaning that he understood the whole concept and that's why Peter spends quite a little portion down through there on your lively stones. Meaning you're not some dead stone somewhere, but you're a, a, a stone of life. There's spirit life to you. Am I making sense right now? And he starts talking about the chief cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected. It goes all the way back to Psalms where it talks about, I'm going to set the headstone and all. And in review of salvation and the headstone being set, he comes right down through there. And here's the verse that it ends with is, and this is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. What day has the Lord made? The day the Lord has made is the day that he will set the cornerstone, the chief stone, and he's going to start his building. When that happens, rejoice. Woo. And now you understand Jesus standing there and says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now you understand, you said, and he that heareth these sayings of mine is like a wise man that builds his house upon a rock. Woo, praise God. Amen. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them you're a stone. Not stoned, you're a stone. You're a stone. Are y'all still with me here? So now it starts taking on a completely different connotation. Now when Peter says, you're lively stones. Now here's, here's where I want you to start kind of seeing this whole thing. Now, back over in the Old Testament, when it's talking about Lucifer, he says, for you were in the center of the stones of fire. It translates, you had your place among the stones of God. You were st strategically placed as a stone among the stones of God. Hmm. Now, one of the things that we learn from Solomon is, I mean, this is where I'm headed. One of the things that we learn from Solomon is this. Uh, the Bible says that when they got to Jerusalem, there's not the sound of a hammer. It's done. There's no cutting. There's no chiseling. It's like a prefabricated building. They did all of that in the quarries and stuff where they were cutting the stones out. And the masons are working there. They took care of all that. And when they got there, they didn't have to chisel it. They didn't have to cut on it. So the Bible talks to me about a temple in the New Jerusalem. And I got news for you. He ain't cutting in there. He's not chiseling on you there. That's already been done. It's been done in this life. Ooh. Are, are you hearing me? 
It's done in this life. Oh, boy, here we go. And see, the problem a lot of times is, is we want to tell God our placement, the measure of our ministry. And that's why I got Lucifer in trouble. Oh, my, my stone is much bigger. I, it's not my place. I, my ministry is a lot bigger than this. I, 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 you, you need to place me way above. And I said, no, I'm the, I'm the builder here. You're the building. I'm the builder. I've never cut a two before yet, and that two before say, don't cut me there. Oh, I'm about to lose some of you right here. Uh, let me, let me, who, who do we pick on? Who we pick on? Who hasn't been picked on? Come up here. You look like somebody needs to be picked on here today. I have learned, I, I feel very strong about what I'm about to say here. I hear people make this kind of a statement in concern of ministry. I, I'll never make a lateral move. What? Yeah, I'll never make, I had a guy tell me that one time, I'll never make a lateral move. Because something was being offered to him, he said, no, I'm not interested in that, I'll never make a lateral move. That'd be a lateral move. See, our North American culture teaches us that the idea of success is always moving forward. That's not God's idea of success. God's idea of success is obedience. Now, I'm, I'm going to, here's where I'm going to get in trouble. You can go over here and God say, okay, I need you to go over here and I want you to build a church that runs into the thousands. There you go. And we would look at that and say, they're successful. But then he could turn to somebody else like an old prophetess I used to know, Marilyn Chenault, and say, all I need you to do is intercede for ministry and pray hours a day to make sure they stay saved. Now, in our ideal of success, we would look at that person and say, boy, they're successful. And then we'd look over here and say, mm, because they never pastored more than probably 40, 50 people. But I'm just going to tell you right now, I do not want to stand next to people like that in judgment. And the pressure's put on us. Now, Brother Sister Drunk, you'll have to fix all this when I leave. I'll honor you, Brother Booker, amen. But here's the deal. We put so much pressure on success, and I, I'm going to use this term, but I'm going to say it very carefully. We use this numbers and growth and all the stuff and all, and so we feel this pressure put on us that we got to produce numbers. Now, trust me, I was asked to come to headquarters a few years ago. We need to talk to you about what, well, you know, you're connected to a lot of young men. We're worried about the way some of them are going. And this is what I said. I, I, they said, we want you to tell us. And I said, Oh, God, I'm going to get in trouble over this one. And I said, well, here's the deal. I said, why, why are they doing this stuff? I said, it's real simple. I said, there's a great gulf. And they've learned the only way to get attention is through numbers. I said, it's either a lot of money or a lot of people. Now, once they start producing that, they get your attention. I said, so then they learn, okay, we got to do this to get your attention. So now they go out here and they learn how to do it. But you don't like the way they're doing it now. Okay, all right, you can fire me after this. I, I, this may be my last time, but that's kind of where it's at. Are, are, you, are you hearing me? I need to remind us of something the Holy Ghost spoke to me the other day. I told Brother Hobson about it earlier. I said, you know, there was a day David forgot. David said some trust in horses and other chariots, but we remember the name of the Lord. That's a psalm and a prayer that David prayed every time before going into battle, and it's in reference to the value of Elah. When it wasn't the size of the army that brought victory, it was the name of God that brought him a great victory. I didn't need a big army to get this done. I just need somebody to go in my name. But David forgot one day when he turns to a backslidden general and said, number them. And God said, oh, so you won't start putting your trust in your numbers. And the day you do that's the day I start destroying them. The day you start putting trust in something besides God is the day that God starts destroying it. He is a God of numbers, yes, but don't make numbers God. Is that a good way of putting it? 
And so pressure and all this stuff and all. I, I was standing one time in a conference and a lady, uh, pastor's wife come up and she had a young man standing there and she said, Brother Moore, I need you to pray for him. I said, he's, oh, hang on, I'll be back to you here in a second. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and so just remind me, I'm up here in chessboard. That's all you got to say. And she said, Brother Moore, you got to pray for this boy. I said, okay. She said, he's just been diagnosed with a disease, cancer, and said, we can't afford to lose him. He's our source. And the moment she said it, Brother Spell, I heard the Holy Ghost said, she just sealed his doom. And I told her that. I said, you shouldn't have said that. She said, why? I said, he's not your source. God is. She said, no, he's our source. I said, oh, my God. And I just looked at the boy. I had pity on the boy. I really, I said, son, I'm sorry. She said, are you going to pray for him? I said, no. No, he ain't going to do me a bit of good pray for that boy. You just sealed his doom. And I mean, within a matter of weeks, he died. You can't look at all this stuff out of here and look at just the resources and, the, and all that and make that your strength and that your source. In God, in God, we trust. That's why it's on your currency. Your forefather said, that's not where it comes from. It comes from God. God's your source, not this. Now, you know, take the pressure off. And now, Brother Sister Uncle, I may be tearing everything up that you guys are trying to work with these guys, but you got to take the pressure off of comparing yourselves among yourselves and looking at somebody over here that's got this and doing that, and then you feel like the only way that you can succeed is you got to do that, and so you lose your ethics, you lose everything. Because you've got to produce something. Feel the Holy Ghost. Well, I'll never make a lateral move. Well, I didn't know. God, God showed me something years ago. I live by this. Ministry's like being a chess piece on a chess board. Sir, I didn't know it was your decision to make which way you went. Oh, ever moves forward. Nope, not on a chess board. Ooh, lateral, backwards. We don't like that, do we? Oh, there's one more. I'm going to sacrifice you now for a bigger move. Thank you. Oh, God doesn't do that. Really? Resurrect John the Baptist and ask him. You know why his offense toward God was? Because one translation says, you go tell John, let me run my business the way I want to run it. Do you really think that John thought when he said, I must decrease, he must increase on the banks of Jordan, behold the Lamb of God. He had it all figured out in his mind where his ministry was going and how it's supposed to play out. And now he's in prison about to lose his head. He said, this ain't the way I had this figured out. Now, won't you listen to me? When it comes to your ministry, you have a lot to do in building it. Mm. I feel just a little resistance from something right now. I have tried to live my life in obedience, never looking. I people ask me, how'd you get your break? Who'd you connect with? I don't even know what you're talking about. I had one pastor wife said, my husband's the reason why you're where you're at. I said, oh, that's funny. I was giving God the credit for it. Is this too plain in here today? No. You see, God knows the exact. Now, now listen, he's building a temple. God's building a house. And every one of us is a stone. And he knows the exact placement. He knows the measurement of it. Because this is the day that the Lord has made. I created all this. I have a blueprint. I know your ministry. Paul said, I'll tell you why I can do all this, because of the grace given unto me. So when God looked at all of us and our ministries and stuff, he said, I'm going to measure this amount of grace into your life. This is going to be your ministry. And the worst thing, come back up here. 
Worst thing you guys, come up here, buddy. Worst thing you can do is, is, is compare. You're not wise. So God tells this guy, I want you to go three steps and stop. I've used this illustration a lot of times. And I want you to go seven steps and stop. And this guy's like, what? Well, that's not fair. Now, I'm, I'm going to pick on you, okay? You married? Okay. <laughs> I want to make sure because I did this here a while back, not this illustration, but it backfired on me. I said, I want your wife to come up here. And he went. Well, it didn't take the gift of discernment to know I was in territory I shouldn't be in. So I turned and looked at the pastor. He went. His wife was sitting over somewhere else. He just left her, and this is his girlfriend sitting there. I'll tell you, I've operated in the gifts, didn't even know I was operating in them. I've stumbled more into stuff. <laughs> Brother Shat was with me one time preaching down in the Houston area, and I kept walking by this guy going, you don't like that, do you? <laughs> Come find out, he was the main one giving the pastor fits and hell, and, and I just kept going by and trying to provoke him. <laughs> I was using him for an illustration. Yeah, I know, but I'm... <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so no, no, I'm not through with you. So you're sitting here and you're like, uh, and then she goes, <laughs> what's wrong with you? He got to go seven steps and you only went three. You lack ambition. You're lazy like your dad. <laughs> oh God, I hope that gift's not operating right now. <laughs> And she looks at him because it's in every woman, the security, and you want your husband to succeed. And, and so she starts putting pressure on you. Well, we know there's at least four more steps because he got to go seven steps. He only went three steps, and I'm telling you right now. You, you, well, if God told you to go three steps, that's it. For a man should not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. For God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. The measure of faith is whatever God spoke to you, stay in those boundaries. And Paul says for you to go beyond that boundary, you've now assumed the position of God. Now you're in pride. And you think you know the next four steps. And the pressure's on. Well, you know, I, but I'm, I, 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 it looks like I'm not as successful. I'm not, I'm not growing as fast as he is. And, and I'm not having revival. And I don't ever get to ask to preach the fellowship meeting and, and then it's what Brother Shatwell said. Then we start coveting these things and, and we start trying to use maneuvers and connect to the right person. And, and I, I use this and then it becomes a little political something and you got to play the game and you got to, and all the stuff went on. God said, okay, y'all sit down. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start trying to, so here, I'm, I'm going to start trying to wrap. Here, here's, here's the deal. God knows. And, and I don't like it when he has to start cutting and chiseling and knocking rough edges off. And then he puts you up to us and no, I'm, I still need to work on you a little bit. If you don't mind, put, put and I'll close with this, put... Uh, uh, what was I at? Second Corinthians three or whatever I gave you back there. Put it on here. I want to. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me. Now he's telling you where he got his ministry. Grace. As a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation another build thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For another foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. All right. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Ooh. Now, up to this point, the Apostle Paul is saying this. He's, he's saying this about people, ministry, and apostles and stuff. So what he's comparing it to is your work is your ministry. That's what he's teaching. And he said, your work the day's going to declare it. 
one day whatever it is that you have built is going to be declared. We're going to see the product. And then we're going to test it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Uh oh. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Hmm. So God says, okay, I'm going to find out what you've built with. You either build with stuff that when you put the fire to it, it doesn't destroy it, it only makes it more pure. Or you're going to use stuff that's going to burn up. You're going to use earthly things. And you're going to learn how to use earthly things to build. And you're going to learn how to do this. You're going to, does that make sense to everybody here? But when the fire comes, if it's wood, hay, or stubble, if it's temporal things you're building with, it's going to be burned. You're going to suffer loss. But Brother Shad, well, that next statement caught my attention. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. What? Now, up to this point, I want you to understand something. Up to this point, Paul's saying, you are the builder and your ministry is your building. Build it with the right stuff. Put it on the right foundation. Use the right resources. Use the right tools. Mm. You're the builder and that's your building. But now watch him flip it. 16. No, you're not that you are the temple of God. Now he flips it. You are no longer the builder. I am. And the building is not your ministry. The building is you. And we get so focused on building ministry and building this stuff. And the pressure gets on us and we'll use wood, hay, and stubble sometimes just so we can get it put up fast. And, and we don't think one thing that more important than me building my ministry is God building me. Know ye not you are the temple of God. Upon this rock, I will build my church. You're my lively stones. Now let me let me read a little something to you here, and I'll stop. I can find it. Next verse. If any man defile the temple of God. Who's going to destroy? You see that temple over there? Mm -hmm. I built it for a house of prayer. But you've made it something it wasn't supposed to be. And because you've turned it into something it's not supposed to be, I'm going to tear it down. There'll not be one stone left upon another. Not one stone. Not one stone. Instead of you getting so focused and worried about building whatever it is you're building, you better understand you can build it and lose it and still be saved. But the one thing that you really need to understand is, is God says, I'm going to build you, and if you defile this, if you make it something it's not supposed to be, that body of yours, if you make it something it's not supposed to be, and you defile that, I'll destroy you. Now, we don't like hearing this. We find it a little negative. Defile temple means making his temple something that is not pure. Defile is to destroy the temple from being what God built it for. And Brother Shatwell got into this very strong. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Here's how it all connects. So I got to studying this out, and this is literally how it translates, and this is what it means, to destroy. He said, now, is it, am I reading that right? Him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Now, if you want to start talking about holiness, whatever God inhabits, over there in the Old Testament, two things. He said, this is where my holiness will be and this is where my name will dwell. And if you're truly the temple of God, the name has to be there and anything that God uses in building you is holy. 
God's not going to occupy an unholy temple. I don't care. That's just that's not. You're, it, it's just, that's not going to happen. And here's the deal. This is what I found. Are you ready for it? To destroy. There's three ways he destroys. Corrupt morally, run financially, and seduce sexually. God said, I'd do that. Most of our prayer time is, God, I'm praying that you build my ministry. You build ever so often. You need to quit just focusing on what you're building and let him turn his attention towards you. He said, I need to chisel and I need to cut. I've been asked before, when do you see churches quit growing? I tell them, when the pastor and the man of God quits growing. When do you see churches corrupted? When, when he does. Yeah. Because the day you decide you don't need God working on you, you don't need God to build you, you don't need to hear stuff like you heard a while ago to help you make sure that you keep that temple of yours from not being joined to a harlot or joined to Belial. Read it, folks. It's in there. Now, we want to tell all of our new converts this when we're going down the list for holiness and all, but we need to be reminded as builders, and you need to look to the great master builder himself who said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and you're a part of that. Know ye not that your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, and in my Father's house are many mansions. I know what you think, but to me, that's temple. That's abode. That's you. That's talking about you. Mansions is not talking about elaborate dwelling place in heaven. God's not over there with an apron on building you an elaborate house. You are that house. The scripture teaches you are that house. You are that mansion. And God's cutting and God's chiseling and God's working on you right now. And so you know what? Just as much as you focus on you building a ministry and brother, sister, please, I hope this doesn't come across and building a church and building all this. You need to spend just as much time letting God build on you and letting God work on you. Keeping yourself saved to make sure that you don't defile your temple. I thank God for what North American Missions is doing right now. I really do. The, the launch and, and the resources and the tools. I've said that all along. I said that's what really to me, that's what the organization ought to be. I don't, I don't call it Home Depot. I call it Church Depot. No, think about it. That's what I've tried to tell the district, Western District. That's what a district should be. It should be, it should be a place. It's like Home Depot except it's Church Depot. You don't go home and build it for them, but your responsibility is if they need plumbing, you've got a department over here that's got plumbing in it. If you need electrical, there's electrical stuff over here. And if you need this, give them the tools, give them the resources, show them this is what you do. We're not trying to go home and tell you how to build. You should already have your own blueprint. But we are trying to provide resources and tools. You need more than just a hammer. You need a screwdriver and you need a saw. Oh, God have mercy. That's why I thank God for the resources. I mean, I sincerely mean that. But you need God to build you. We need. We're coming to a point. We have a little space left, and there's a lot of stuff. There's every time that we need to learn how to build and to be built. It's right now. We have to shift ourselves from just maintaining to the building. close with this little illustration I have tried so hard I taking too much time the deal I've tried so hard most of all my life ministry just to find the will of God and do it I mean that, that's just the way I've lived I went to San Francisco because of a dream and and a call of God uh Two teenage daughters and a four-year-old boy because of a dream. 
So I went. <laughs> I didn't have, and I don't mean this, but I didn't have Christmas of Christ. I, had, I just went because it's the will of God to go do it. Well, I'll do it as long as I'm, I don't know. I just, you know, I'm gone. And uh, I've tried to live my life that way. I, I was offered a, a congregation one time in another city and it's a pretty lucrative deal. I had uh, at that time maybe seven or eight people. We were meeting in our living room and a pulpit committee contacted me and said, uh, we'd like for you to take the church and your name is at the top of the list and if you would consent to us voting on you and you know and uh, they put in there all the finances <laughs> whoa if I remember right the salary was somewhere around 300,000 a year and I'm sitting there with seven people brother Dylan never owned a home Everything I'd ever had is gone. Trying to build this church, launch this church. Huh. And I get the letter. And so I start teasing Naomi. I'm, I'm a provoker. I, I need to pray through over that. But I said, now, won't you look at this? I mean, this is, I need to start thinking about our future. And, and she said, you, you're serious about that? I said, yeah. I want me to look at the figures on here. I said, well, hope you're happy if you go. <laughs> now, just, just understand, here's, here's the wife. Security and all that means a lot to her. And I get it. I, 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 and I want, I, I hope you're happy. If you go, I hope you're happy. Because we're, you, I know you, you'll be miserable. This is not the will of God. God didn't tell you to do this, and you'll be miserable, and I know you'll be miserable. And if you're miserable, you're going to make all of us miserable. I said, but now I really do. I've, I've, I need to think about this. But what she didn't know was she didn't read down the deal. It said I had to sign the letter, yes or no, send the letter back, sign, yes or no. Well, she didn't see no. She only, so I signed it, put it in an envelope, well, she thinks I'm signing it to send it back that I want to take to church. I check no. It's so all the way to the post. <laughs> all the way to the post office. She's sitting over there. <laughs> Not a word. We pull up one of those, you know, you drive, roll the window down. I dropped it in there. And as soon as I dropped it in there, I said, there that goes. She said, I hope you're happy. I said, I'm very happy. She said, Mark, I don't understand this. She said, all of our lives, you've tried to live to do the will of God. And now that means more to you than the will of God. I said, oh, no. I'm not taking that church. I said, I checked the box. No, I just let them know I'm not taking the church. She said, I hate you sometimes. You know that. <laughs> Here it is. This is the day the Lord has made. The shadow, well, you've kind of bumped this a couple of times. I, sometimes we get so focused on five years, ten years. Two things I've learned will cause you not to rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice. I've learned two things that will cause you not to rejoice. Yesterday and tomorrow. Yesterday is your mistakes, all this stuff and all. Tomorrow is you're trying to live in a world that there is not provisions yet. And you're already over there facing everything that's in the future. But you don't really have the true provisions of God yet. And so you're facing, that's why Jesus said, take no fault for tomorrow. So a few weeks ago, I was in the office, the Lord said, I want to help you with something. All I need from you 
is today. Give us this day our daily bread. You see, son, I hold the blueprint to your day. Now you're either going to construct it or destruct it. You'll live this day either doing my will or not doing my will. And the way that you determine that is at the altar. If you'll die out to what you want to build today and you'll build what I want to build, that's all I need from you is today. So I got on a whiteboard and I drew a little block. I told Jeremy and the boys in there, I said, that's today. That's me today. And then the Holy Ghost said, but days connect and make weeks. And weeks connect and make months. And months, and then I started drawing seven blocks, and then I drew 30 blocks. And then I started little bitty blocks, and I built this temple with little blocks because months make years, and years makes a life. And then I seen it, I seen it, I seen the end of my life, the temple, the structure, and it all started today. If I can just let him build me today, I can just do his will today. I'm successful. Just today, brother, sister, today, today. I'm going to tell you, God can show you the blueprint, but I'm going to tell you, he's got his own way of doing all this. And I've, you've got to learn that today, 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 today. Is it, am, I, am I beating this to death? Today, today. Just build today. Let God build you today. Just find his will. Get the blueprint. Not my will. Jesus didn't die on the cross. He died in the garden. When he said, nonetheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And the biggest battle we have is self-will versus the will of God. That's the biggest battle that you have. I want to do it this way. I want to have it this way. I want... This is not Burger King, folks. You don't get it your way. You must understand, I got to get to that altar and I got to die, die out. And if I'll die out, that's what Paul said. I, 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 guess I asked Dr. Hughes, I said, what's the deal? Why, why a living sacrifice? He said, well, that's simple. He said, in the Old Testament, you killed it, put it on the altar. It didn't crawl off. It's there. He said, but with us, I can die today, but tomorrow I can crawl right off that altar and start living again. He said, that means every day. And I heard the Apostle Paul make that statement. Is this, is this kind of off from where we're supposed to be here? Paul said, I die daily. My will is brought under subjection. This is true submission. My mission is brought under to his mission submission I submit my mission to his mission and you know what Paul said we're laborers together with Christ and if I can just find out what he wants to build and how he wants to build it he says come on come help me do this we're going to build quite a house here I'm going to build you and you're going to build quite a ministry okay I gotta stop let's stand North American missions and their department's doing a great job. They're going to give you tools and resources and tell you a lot of stuff. And I thank you for that. I really mean that. But my, my point today is, is to remind you, you can get the tools and you need some resources. But just let God keep working and building you. Let's just do the will of God. The greatest harvest the world has ever seen is before us. We're in a field with little like rotting lawnmowers. That's what we're getting. God's intent is to give us massive combines. I feel the Holy Ghost right here. Man told me that. Had the vision. Seven days, his church praying and fasting. He said, Brother Morgan, on the fourth day, the Lord came to me in a vision. He said, I'm not prone to visions. And he said, in the vision, I seen a wheat field. You couldn't see the end of it. The field's the world. The field is the world. And he said, there was a man out there on a little riding lawnmower. I feel a word for somebody here right now. A little riding lawnmower out there. And the man stood next to him and said, you see that man out there? Yes, sir. That's you, and that's how much harvest you're getting. 
But if you'll come with me, I'll show you God's intent for the end time. Hmm. He said, Brother Morgan, I turned. He said, I can't tell you how big the barn was. We walked in. He said, in that barn was a massive combine. He said, I can't even begin to tell you how big it was. And he said, the man, which he believed at that time was the angel of the Lord, said, climb up in the driver's seat. So he said, I got up there. He said, this is God's intent for the end time. He said, I got up there, and the man said, what do you notice? What do you see? And the man said, I looked around, Brother Morgan. It had no steering wheel. And he said, I told the angel it has no steering wheel. He said, that's exactly right. This can only be led by the Holy Ghost. That's why I'm talking to you about the will of God and you dying out and you quit trying to build what you want to build and do what you want to do and you need to submit because God has an intent. And I'm just going to tell you, some of our biggest struggles in the end time is going to be learning how to work with 11th hour workers. God using people that we don't think is holy enough, pure enough, godly enough. I lost you right there. Well, they ain't been here as long as we have. They Well, yeah, you know what the problem is? We're so focused on labors. Jesus is not so much focused on the labor as he is focused on that field right now. And we get to looking at each other, comparing, and we want to... We, we, we want to compare labors, to labors and all that stuff and all. Well, I read one time about that happening before. And here's another word for somebody. You ready for it? I got two brothers that went into a field to harvest in Genesis. And one brother was jealous of another brother and killed him right there in that field. And when his blood hit that field, it become cursed. It was cursed. And God said, where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? You went into the field together. He said, I hear your brother's blood crying to me from the ground. He said, from this day forth, he said, your field will not give strength. You've lost your harvest. You killed your harvest harvest with your brother's blood and the enemy knows we can get into that harvest and all and get self-willed and get jealous and get all this stuff because God's using this one and God's honoring their sacrifice and if I kill them and I destroy them then that means I'm the only thing left that God can use that's that's not how this is going to go down but let me tell you what the Holy Ghost spoke to me the other day about this Cain said okay you're marked you're cursed go away out of my presence. He said, you know, everybody sees me because this mark on me, they're going to try to kill me. God said, no, no. If they kill you, he said, I'll visit them sevenfold. I read that the other day in the handbook on the Bible. Brother Booker, you know what that means? If they kill you, I'll kill seven members of their family. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to quit trying to kill the killers. You see a brother kill somebody and you think you're vindicated to take their life. If you do, your judgment will be harsher than their judgment. Read it, it's in there. Our biggest battle right now, you listen to me, our biggest battle right now is trying to kill each other in the field and, and, and compare ourselves and jealousy provoking us and, and you don't like what they're doing and you don't agree with it, so just make up a story and say something, something you hear. Some, are y'all listening to me here today? And go ahead and cut their throat, let them bleed out in that field you're supposed to be working in and then you wonder why you're not getting a harvest and not, why your field's not yielding its strength. We need to join hand in hand and go into that field and work together. And however God chooses to use that man or that man or me or however, that's his business. He's the one building this thing. I'm just a part of, I'm just a stone in the whole building of all this. I hope I'm helping somebody in the Holy Ghost here right now. You need to get your eyes off of each other and say, you know what? I need to look unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of my faith. And I need to compare myself with him. If you want to compare yourself, compare it with him. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. 
I think we need to pray one for another right now. We need to ask God. And some of you need to repent. Well, they killed somebody and they murdered somebody, so I got a right to take their life. No, you don't. No, you don't. You're saying that God's judgment's not good enough. You need to help him out here a little bit. That's what he was teaching about last night, about the tragedy of a wounded spirit. I'm going to help God's judgment on this. Come on, turn and connect with somebody right now and, and, and pray one for another. And, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what size your church is. It doesn't matter what your, your, your my, we're laborers together. We, we, he's the Lord of the harvest. I want to get into that field with that massive combine. And it might be all of us coming together. Come on, pray one for another. Pray one for another. I feel the work of the Holy Ghost right now. Massive harvest. Massive harvest. Massive harvest. Massive harvest. Pray you therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers. Woo! Come on, God's calling 11th hour workers. God's calling you. I need you in the field. The season's about to close. The fullness of the Gentiles is just about over. There's one last great harvest among the Gentile nations. Quit trying to figure it out. Just go do my will.